But without further ado, I'll pass over to our New Zealand buyer, Freddie Bulmer, to introduce Mackenzie and the Atarangi wines. Hello, everybody. Thanks for that, Tim. Hopefully you can hear me okay. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say a huge, first of all, a huge thank you to everybody for joining us. It's great to see so many people logging on for this. Um, but uh, I guess it's unsurprising when you've got one of what is undoubtedly the greatest New Zealand wineries uh, hosting a, uh, a masterclass, a session for us. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm every bit as excited about this as I'm sure all of you are. Uh, Tim mentioned that we've got uh, Mackenzie Payton uh hosting for us this evening so Mackenzie uh we're in very safe hands with her we've uh, she's the daughter of Clive and Phil Payton and, and it was her aunt Alison along with them who founded the winery um I've basically seen this as an excellent uh opportunity to enjoy a much better bottle of wine or two even than I might normally have enjoyed on a Thursday so I've actually got the 2018 Crimson and 2018 uh flagship Pinot uh, in front of me here. So I'm looking forward to tucking into them. Um, and actually, I've already learned something from just chatting with Mackenzie previous to uh, to this kicking off this evening, which is that I've always been pronouncing it wrong. It's not Atarangi. Uh, Mackenzie very helpfully just said, think of it as though you're pronouncing it in Italian. So I'm going to give it a go. Mackenzie, you can correct me because I'll no doubt completely fudge this. Uh, but it's Atarangi. Is that right? That sort of thing? Is that close yeah, enough? Yeah, exactly. Atarangi. Atarangi. <laughs> the thing is that mum and dad have been saying it wrong for the last 30 or 40 years as well. It's a little bit of a generational thing about pronouncing Māori words correctly. So, um, I, uh, I apologise, but I don't feel so bad knowing that they've been pronouncing it wrong as well. So that's OK. But Mackenzie, thanks so much for joining us. Um, I'll hand over to you and uh, we'll start off with a, with a cheers. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you so much for having me. Um, it is fantastic to see all the comments coming in. I think there are a lot of people here who um, who have been to Atarangi, who know it. Uh, that is so awesome. Some of you might be new, um, but it seems like there are a lot of people who already know and love Atarangi, so that's really cool. Um, I am so excited to be here talking to you all. I'm normally, I'm based in London and I normally work with a fantastic champagne brand. So today to have the chance to talk about home is really, really nice. Um, so yeah, uh, Rachel, um, all good, lovely to start the presentation. So here we are at the front gate of Atarangi. Um, so I'll, I'd love to start by talking about the story of Atarangi. And to me, the story of Atarangi is so intertwined with the story of the modern wine industry in New Zealand. So if we uh, roll back to the 1970s in New Zealand, I think the context is really, really important. So um, uh, some of you might have visited in the 70s or, or 80s or, um, you know, in the last couple of years even, but in the 1970s, New Zealand was really a rural nation, small town, beer drinking. I think the average wine consumption um, for the country was about one bottle per household per year. Um, uh, and primarily an agricultural nation. So we had three main industries, wool, meat, and dairy, and uh, really not a lot else. We were sending a lot of it to the UK. Um, and I think there were less than 90 small wineries in New Zealand at this stage. Um, so roll in uh, a scientist called Derek Milne, who was commissioned by the government in the late 1970s to look at these pieces of land um, that you couldn't really farm that were a little, um, uh, the dry lands of New Zealand. And he went to, uh, to Martin Borough, to the Wairarapa. And actually, <laughs> um, if we can flip to the map, that would be wonderful, just so we can kind of ground and locate where we are. Oh, actually, one back. <laughs> um, just so that you can see, I've, I've been talking about Atarangi for a little while. All right, uh, to the map. So uh, we are based in Martinborough. It's now a village of about 1,200 people, and we're, we're at the bottom of the North Island of New Zealand. Um, so... Um, so basically, dry lands of New Zealand, scientist Derek Milne 
so he looked at this dry, empty, stony land, which you can see in this picture here, on the edge of, um, of the riverbed in Martinborough in this tiny town. And he looked at the soils and the climate and he said, we can grow great wine here. This is similar to parts of Burgundy in terms of the temperature, the climate, the soils. Um, and so he, <laughs> he published a report and he had a meeting at the town hall where he, um, he told everyone about it. So 1980, enroll four groups of absolutely crazy people who decide to buy these pieces of land um, on the edge of the Martin Borough Township and start to plant vines. And one of those people was my father, Clive. So <laughs> he was 29 years old. He was a solo dad bringing up my half-sister, Ness. Um, and he owned about 300 cows and he was a share milker. So he owned the cows, but not the land. And uh, he had what he calls an early midlife crisis where he didn't want to milk cows um, for the rest of his life. So he um, he sold his 300 cows and he bought this piece of land that you can see in this in this picture from 1980 um, and planted vines. And he couldn't uh, he couldn't make wine for the first five years. The weather was quite bad um, in Martinborough, so the first four uh, sets of people they um, they were hoping to make wine by about year three, but it, uh, it wasn't until year five they were able to make their first tiny harvests. And uh, they actually all banded together. The the four pioneers of Martinborough they put money together to get the local builder to put together the very first wine press that they all shared and they shared all the same winery equipment. Um, and uh, Clive couldn't make wine, so he grew garlic and pumpkins between the rows to make ends meet. Um, and then he would drive them about an hour and a half over the hill to Wellington, to our capital city every Sunday to sell them at the Sunday market. Um, and uh, first tiny harvest in 1985. I think we can go to the next slide, Rachel. Uh, brilliant. Um, so <laughs> we've got some classic 80s pictures there. So Clive and my sister Ness uh, on the side and her very first job at age five was digging rocks out of the vineyard, um, which I guess now that seems a little um, extreme, but... <laughs> It seemed to work. And then uh, my aunt Alison is in is in the second picture. So dad convinced his sister to join the business. So she bought a piece of land right next door. She joined the business and uh, she actually came to London to work in the wine industry while the grapes grew. And uh, then towards the end of the 80s, he met one of New Zealand's first female winemakers. Her name was Phil Patty. Uh, that was mum. She was in Marlborough making <laughs> really bad Muller Turgau at the time for uh, Montana, which is now Brancot Estate, in the days before Sauvignon Blanc. So uh, she joined the business, fell in love with dad, and um, joined the business. And today, 40 years later, Aparangi is still owned and managed by this family trio of mum, dad, and Auntie Ellie, so Phil, Clive, and Alison. Um, and uh, dad had said, you know, I don't know if this is going to work. When he first planted the vines and he said, look, I'll give it 10 years and I'll see how it goes. And if it doesn't work, I'll do something else. But now he also says that he had to have he had to make it work because he didn't really have a backup plan. But um, before the 80s were over, they won the Air New Zealand Wine Awards three times in a row. And then in the 90s, um, they won the International Wine and Spirit Bouchard Finlayson Trophy for the best Pinot Noir in London three times in a row, so 95, 96, and 2001. And for that, them, that was a moment where New Zealand and Martinborough Pinot Noir from this very small town started to started to be um, a bit of an international phenomenon, something that was really on the map, not just in New Zealand, not just in Auckland, but in London and um, and right across the world. So that was a really big moment for them. 
Uh, Lindsay, can I just quickly ask, um, do you think that your dad had any idea of, of the potential, uh, uh, you know, of, of what he was starting back in the early days? Because, I mean, it's fair to say that it's it's not only done quite well. I mean, now as, as a winery, it's considered amongst kind of, you know, the great wineries of the world. So do you think he had any idea? <laughs> Strangely, yes, I do. I think he so dad is someone that I say and hopefully this makes sense we always say he thinks like a tree so he, you know it's quite hard to get him to think about tomorrow or next week but 100 year chunks is kind of the way that that he thinks about the world and then if you can kind of you know break it down into 10 you know, 20 year chunks then you know you're, you're having a proper conversation with dad so he really did have a long-term vision and when he first met mum, she moved to Martinborough and there were two pubs and a fish and chip shop. And she looked around at this tiny town and, and just went, mm. and he said, look, in five years, we're going to be able to walk down this street and pick which restaurant we want to go to. So he had this idea that, um, that the wine region would transform the town, but he also had this real vision right from the start for world-class Pinot Noir. Um, when he was young, uh, he had a friend who used to take him hiking, not too young, like in his 20s. They used to go hiking up beautiful mountains in New Zealand and no one really drank wine at this time, but this friend absolutely adored um, world-class Burgundy. And so they'd be up the top, you know, two, 3,000 metres up the top of this mountain and his friend would get a bottle of an incredible wine out of his um, out of his pack and and the glasses and that was one of Dad's introductions to to incredible wine. So he's um, he's someone who's very soft spoken, um, very quiet, but he really has this conviction um, and and long term vision. So we're constantly I'm trying to talk about you know next year and he's going well you know your your grandkids you know and their and their children like this is that how that's going to affect them and I'm like okay dad but you know <laughs> but I think I mean I guess that that's a that's a really good trait to have uh in the wine world because obviously wine takes time doesn't it and to start a, a a serious winery that's got a long lifespan you have to think in in generations not years or even months you know so uh he's he's clearly uh clearly born to do this which is which is fantastic and I guess well, the proof is in the pudding, as they say, as well, which is great. Yeah, absolutely. And just that thing in the wine industry that people talk about so much, the decision that you make now is going to have an impact 20 years from now, 30 years from now. The way that you care for the vines when they're young is mm. absolutely going to affect what they're like 40 years from now, 50 years from now. So um I think Atarangi is um, not just dad, but the whole family and the whole Atarangi team really do have that long-term vision, which I think I think is pretty special. Fantastic. Um, so, yeah. Um, and Martin Barra itself. Okay, so I love this picture. So again, Atarangi in 1980, and then this was our winery in 2007. Um, we'll get to this, but dad loves trees. <laughs> There's a, there's a whole story around that, but um, you can see the transformation of the land and uh, it has echoes that are a lot bigger. Um, can we pop to the next slide? Oh, so yeah, that was today. That was Clive, Phil and Ellie. Um, so we were joined in 2003 by the incredible, indomitable winemaker, Helen Masters. If anyone of you has met her, you will never forget her, the most incredible sense of humour, um, one of the best palettes in the country. And in 2019, she was awarded New Zealand Winemaker of the Year, incredibly well-deserved. And she's really uh, an incredible voice for the industry as well. She's she's an, an amazing person to have at the helm of Atarangi. Cool. Can we go to the next map? Beautiful. So <laughs> I'd just love to talk a little bit about what makes Martin Barra so special. And Freddie, let me know how we're doing for time as well. Um, I think I think we're doing doing pretty well. So uh, yeah, please do uh, do carry on. No fabulous. Um, so Martin Barra 
uh, today, it makes um, about 1% of New Zealand's wine by volume and it has about 4% of its planted area. So we really are a small region, but we do um, punch above our weight. And what makes it so special and what the scientist Derek Milne was talking about in the 70s was this rain shadow that we have. So uh, to, to the east and to the northeast, we have kilometers and kilometers of rolling hills, which help protect on one side and then you can see that we have the Rimataka and the Tararua Ranges, which form part of the mountain spine that runs right up the, the North and the South Island. Um, and uh, basically all of the bad weather comes across from Australia and drops seven metres of rain every year on, on those ranges. And it's only a 15 minute drive from the base of those mountains to Martinborough. It's always raining in Featherston. It's never raining in Martinborough. So we are completely protected. We only get 700 mil of rainfall every year versus seven meters in the mountains. So we have this fantastic dry climate, which is of course great for viticulture, especially for organic and sustainable viticulture. Um, and uh, we are also incredibly exposed to the South. So you can see that the valley is open at the bottom and there really is nothing between us and Antarctica. So if you're standing in Martinborough, and some of you will have, and the weather changes, the wind changes and comes from the south, you can tell because it is icy cold. So we have beautiful long days, great sunshine hours in the summer. It can get up into the into the early 30s. So it might be 33 degree, uh, degrees one day during the day and eight degrees that same night. So we have this fantastic diurnal shift, which is great for, um, for allowing long ripening of Pinot Noir. And Martinborough, as a wine region, has one of New Zealand's longest growing seasons by about three weeks. Um, so uh, much longer than central Otago, just because we have that lovely, cool uh, climate, southern influence. And then on top of that, that wind is incredibly fierce. And uh, unfortunately, fortunately, unfortunately, during the spring, during flowering, the winds are often very fierce and they knock a lot of flowers off the bunches. And uh, that results as the fruit ripens in this very loose bunch architecture. So the wind goes right through and it toughens up the skins and the berries are very small. So we have this fantastic skin and seed to juice ratio, um, which allows for fantastic complex uh, rich tannins but um, that wonderful long growing season means that um, we get incredible balance and we're not worrying too much about uh, you know low acidity and high alcohol we can just get fantastic phenolic ripeness and, and ripeness of tannin um, at the perfect level which really sets up Martinborough to be a fantastic region for Pinot Noir. Mackenzie, can I just ask, um, going back to what you're just saying about the about the winds uh, coming through the vineyards, um, does that make it quite a good region then for people to be working organically? Are there quite a lot of organic uh, wines being made there? Yeah, absolutely. And um, because Martinborough is naturally very low yielding as well, um, it really you can't. It's impossible to do really big kind of high volume production. So it really lends itself not only to organics. Um, because of the, the climate um, and that wind, but also to really high quality boutique production. You have a lot of smaller producers in Martinborough. Um, again, we're naturally low yielding for us at Atarangi. Our, um, our Pinot Noir is something like four tons to the hectare, which is the same as um, Grand Cru sites in Burgundy. So we, we don't have a lot of grapes, they're not very big but what they do produce is great quality. Um, but yes, there is a, a really strong um, sustainable vision in Martinborough. Um, and certainly it's been part of the philosophy of Atarangi since day one. Um, okay. Oh, great. Oh, well, it's uh, obviously the right, right part of the world to be in then where you guys set up. <laughs> not biased or anything. No, not, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah. Um, Yes, no, so from, from four vineyards in uh, 1980, there are now about 40 vineyards in Martinborough. Um, and today, um, again, we're, we're still family owned and managed, but um, 
we really the philosophy really has been about organic since day one but again talking about that long-term vision that dad has it wasn't something that he even questioned he didn't really talk about it um except to you know tell people that he wasn't completely crazy because small town 1980s a making wine and then b being organic um was you know was really really quite different um but we've never used herbicides or pesticides at Atarangi. the um the wider environment has always been really really important to what we do so we've um we have always and continue to plant wildflowers between the rows just to encourage natural biodiversity and uh, dad has a, a real love for native new zealand trees and birds so we have native shelter belts across every vineyard that really help to encourage the, the insects and the birds that are uh, native to new zealand um, and then um, of course we also uh, put a lot of what we produce back into the soil so all of our um, stalks and, and seeds and skins get turned into these wonderful bubbling compost teas that then get put back uh, under the vines to basically to nourish the soil and to continue that cycle. Um, also, everything is hand harvested, always has been. We do a lot of work manually in the vineyard so that we don't have to have to use sprays, herbicides, pesticides. So it takes a lot more manual work to do that. Um, but uh, it's it's just part of the part of the philosophy, really. <laughs> the natural ecosystem um, is so important. Dad is the kind of man who uh, won't let us kill spiders because they're part of the house or the window. Um, so he's always had that kind of vision. All right. So, um, and actually, you started uh, talking about the pronunciation of Atarangi, and I think that's really important to explain the meaning of the name. So when Dad was still living on the farm and he had this midlife crisis, he, um, he wanted to find a word that would express that new start. And to him, the, the Māori language, he, he had incredible respect for. And for him, that was the language of the land. And naturally, it had to be the language that we would use. So he lived next to a very, very respected Māori elder and historian called Sir Mitakata, who was a, a good friend of his. And so he went and he said, look, this is this crazy new start. Can you help me find something that, that sums this up? And uh, Sir Mita came up with, Atarangi. So Ata is um, a particular name for the phase, phase of the morning. So the Māori language has many different um, words for phases of the morning. And um, Rangi, Ranganui is the god of the sky. So together Atarangi means dawn sky, new beginning. Um, and it's, it's quite cool because not only was it a new beginning back then, but every day is a new start. Um, so... I think it's quite special. All right. Oh, and this is the uh, the Atarangi cellar door. So that was the original winery. And now if you visit, some of you will, will know this scene well. Uh, so mum and dad built the winery with um, a couple of friends. And there's a picture of my sister on the, um, you know, on the iron beams on a baby bouncer. Um, 90s, anyway. Um, but that's a very that may be a very familiar scene for some of you. Cool. Have you got the the Atarangi the eighteen Pinot Noir there, Freddie? I do. Yeah. So I've got I'm lucky enough to have both the crimson and uh, and the flagship uh, Pinots, both from twenty eighteen. Um, I thought why why just have one when you can have both? So it was a no brainer. I think they're both they're both looking they're both looking lovely. I I think my first sort of um, uh, feeling on on tasting them today is just I'm overwhelmed by their potential. Um, you know I think that they have there's so much life and so much energy in both of these wines, um, but the potential for them to to age just seems quite remarkable. And there was a comment earlier 
actually about the 2014 wine. Um, I can't quite find it, but somebody commented saying that actually it would go long beyond the wine society's kind of recommended drinking window of up until 2023. And, and, and I mean, yeah, absolutely right. Apologies, I can't sort of um, uh, find the exact comment, but I think that's absolutely right. You know, and I think uh, these are certainly wines that will benefit from from lying down. I mean, the, the Crimson, of course, is the one which is designed for slightly younger drinking. Um, but it, chatting, it, um, Rachel and I were saying just before we, we started that even that has, has a, a, you know, as much life in it as many wineries top Pinots might do. So it's quite amazing. It, but um, yeah. Absolutely. And there's a real story there with Crimson initially being this younger Vines wine and now has, has grown up and really is what the Atarangi Pinot was 20 years ago. There really is no difference between where they're grown or, or how they're grown. It's really just fine age, the difference between them, which um, I'm happy to get into a little more. But yeah, I mean, stored well. The crimson at home, we're very, very happy to open a 10 year old bottle of wine and it's still yeah. fresh as a daisy. Beautiful somebody, softness. But somebody's just commented, Mackenzie saying that the 1999 is still fresh, which I'm, I'm assuming is the Atarangi uh, Pinot Noir. Uh, but uh, it's lovely Amazing. to see such old wines on here. It's fantastic. That is, that is fantastic. Um, <laughs> and 99 was still under cork, I believe. I think we moved to screw top in, two, in the early 2000s. So maybe okay. 2004. So um, that, that's brilliant. Have you noticed any, um, I mean, this is such a, sorry, sorry, such a common sort of question uh, for New Zealand and Australian wineries, but have you noticed a significant difference in the ageing of the wines since they've been under screw cap? Have you found that actually they age more slowly or not much? Of a Consistency is, is the thing we, mo we notice most and also um, retaining the freshness for longer, which, you know, there's no problem with mm -hmm. that for ageing you know, for Pinot Noir that is really meant to age. Uh, we find that under screw top, most of the time, um, the wines will really retain their fruit for about eight years, and then it will start, the fruit characters will start to soften, and that's when you really start to see some of those beautiful mushroomy forest floor characters. Um, fantastic. Yeah. Oh, it's uh, really interesting. There's some fantastic questions coming in, so we'll, we'll get to those shortly, but we should, uh, oh. we should probably have a little taste. Yeah, no, so I'd love to um, to just tell the story of the Able clone as well, because that's, um, yes, that's yes. a story that's very special for Atarangi. So um, in the 1970s, somebody jumped the fence at either some winery in Burgundy, maybe Romani Conti, maybe Latash, the legend, you know, the, the legend changes every time the story is told, but this person, they might have been a rugby player, they might have been an all black, who knows. They um, tried to smuggle in these vine cuttings into New Zealand in their gumboots. And uh, the customs officer who stopped them, uh, he found them and he happened to be a keen winemaker. So, <laughs> and his name was Malcolm Abel and he got them put through quarantine and planted in his own vineyard. And at this stage, uh, New Zealand only had clones from, um, from Champagne, Pinot Noir clones from Champagne, which are fantastic for sparkling wine. But if you're really looking for world-class Pinot Noir, then it, it wasn't, they weren't the grapes to look for. Uh, Dad, when he was learning how to make wine, he, uh, his very first harvest was in Auckland with Malcolm Abel at his vineyard. And when he came home, Malcolm gave him 200 cuttings of this clone two of the gumboot clones plant at Atarangi. And unfortunately, Malcolm died quite soon afterwards and his vineyard was pulled out a few years later. So we have the original plantings in New Zealand of the Abel clone. And uh, we, um, for about 15 years, it was just uh, Atarangi that had it. And then the family decided to share it. Now it's one of the premium clones right across the country. Um, it's certainly one that a lot of people talk about very proudly. And um, I mean, this is a guess, but I would say that probably the majority of New Zealand's top Pinots are probably the Abel clone. Um, I, I think it's probably fair to say, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, 
I know that Atarangi has the the highest proportion of able clone in, in any of their wines. So for uh, Atarangi, our crimson and our single vineyard, the Crone Pinot Noir, it's always 50%. And wow. we also have the, the oldest plantings. And it's something that does so well with Martin Dyer's Tewa um, that we get these incredibly, uh, to me, they're kind of, Martin Dyer Pinots are kind of brooding and a little bit moody and you get, these um so much tannin but it's fine and it has so much length and tension to it um and to me the able clone and martin Dara and atarangi they're all kind of synonymous in a way they you know it's all part of that story it's uh, it's a later uh, ripening clone uh, and it's a little bit more vigorous which is great for martin Dara's naturally low yielding soils uh, so it misses the the fiercest of the spring frosts, which is a huge issue in Martin Barra, and then uh, uh, ripens a little later. Um, so, uh... interestingly, there's there's uh, for anyone who's in well who is interested, I'm sure a lot of people on here are. I was. There's a documentary or a short well, I was going to say short film. It's actually a fairly long film on Amazon called A Seat at the Table, uh, which which uh, Atarangi is is featured in and there's a fantastic shot in that of a bottle of the Pinot on the wall at Domaine de la Romani Conti um, and I, I can't remember um, whether Aubert de Villain from Domaine de la Romani Conti is, is interviewed in that uh, but he's certainly aware that uh, at some point in, in the past somebody nabbed a few vine cuttings and, and, and now there's some fantastic Pinot in New Zealand as a result of that. It was, uh, it was a lovely shot though to see the bottle on the wall there. Dad, uh, Dad ended up at an event with him, and I know he, he doesn't get out that very often, but they ended up sitting at the table next to each other at some event, and there was a lot going on, and they just spent the whole evening just talking and tasting wine very quietly. These two very kind of soft-spoken, very focused people. And That's so I, I always remember that story. That's amazing. Um, two, of the, two of the greatest Pinot Noir producers in the world sat together. Fantastic. Well, I mean, for me, this is just homebrew, but... You know, <laughs> but yeah, um, what was really incredible was in 2010, the New Zealand wine industry body um, awarded two producers the, uh, the equivalent of New Zealand Grand Cru. So they f founded the inaugural Tupiranga Tai Tai or Aotearoa award, which is um, the equivalent of Grand Cru status. It means the great growth of New Zealand. And uh, in 2010, at the International Pinot Noir Conference in Central Otago, uh, mum and dad and, and Helen and Ellie were completely blown away um, that Atarangi Pinot Noir was awarded the status alongside our great friends at Felton Road. And uh, to this day, we are still, Atarangi and Felton Road are still the only two producers that, that have this status. And it's really for um, consistency at the highest level um, across a really long period of time with um, a philosophy that lifts the rest of the industry. So um, for them, that was a really, really humbling moment. Um, and then we have Crimson originally thought of as our kind of younger vines baby it was made in 2003 um, from vines that were about five years old we were starting to see some serious vine age in the in the Atarangi Pinot Noir we just call it our Pinot but it, it really is our flagship wine and then um, we didn't want to put this lovely vibrant bright young fruit into something that was starting to see some serious vine age so we made a separate younger vines Pinot Noir and at the same time Dad um, had been able to hand the reins over to Helen uh, and focus and kind of reinvent himself again and start planting trees. So he bought, he convinced the family to buy some promising grape growing land, about 300 acres, 20 minutes south of Martinborough. And, and uh, he still hasn't planted vines on the front two paddocks 20 years later, but he has planted close to 100,000 native New Zealand trees. Actually, some of those are ground durable eucalypts for vine posts, but um, he, he uh, placed a legal covenant on the land so the trees can never be chopped down. And he also founded a conservation trust that looks after that entire mountain range. I think for Dad, he really feels the loss of um, 
of what happened to New Zealand over the last 300 years, you know, our ancestors coming in and deforesting most of the country and converting it into farmland. And we have such a special, unique uh, flora and fauna and, and country. And I think he really, he really feels that and he really cares about it. Um, so he was walking in the forest with the mates and they found some trees that were about a thousand years old. They're called rata trees and they bloom deep, deep, deep red for about four weeks of the year at Christmas time, the same as their coastal cousins, the Pahutakawa. And he realised they'd been right across the country, right across our mountain range, and he started propagating and planting them at the same time that we started to make this younger vines wine. And, uh, you know, there's a wonderful connection between this beautiful crimson colour of the Pinot Noir and the trees, which which bloom that incredible crimson colour at Christmas time. And they, the Pahutakawa and Rata, were incredibly endangered uh, in New Zealand for a while, especially in the 80s. And they um, they were at risk of becoming extinct, some of the, some of the different species. So um, Project Crimson has been around for a long time. They do fantastic work right across the country, looking after Pahutakawa, Rata and other native trees. And so in 2003, we reached out to them, formed a partnership, and uh, sales of Crimson Pinot Noir have been supporting that conservation and tree planting effort since uh, since then. Um, and now, you know, it's not a younger vine dearly drinking baby anymore. Um, the wines, the average vine age, I think, is um, 18, 19 years old. So uh, sourced um, basically from the same vineyards that the Atarangi Pinot Noir is planted in, but uh, just from the slightly younger parcels. It's fantastic. I must say it's drinking really, really nicely, actually, the Crimson. And the lovely thing about having these two wines is that uh, you can sit and drink the Crimson and enjoy that while you're waiting for the flagship wine to, to kind of mature and, and really start to show its full kind of potential, I suppose. Um, Mackenzie, I just want to say, first of all, a huge... Thank you, because this has been really fascinating to, to listen to. And there's been so many uh, questions and comments from people. Um, so obviously everyone else has been really enjoying it as well, which is fab. Um, I, I wanted to actually kick off, if I could, with um, asking a question or, or just, well, kicking off the questions, uh, which we've had John Cavanna has posted a question in the Q&A thing here. That I would oh, just like to get your hi, opinion. John. Oh yeah, okay. <laughs> perfect. That, that's that's my. I think that's my brother-in-law. There you go. Perfect. Because it's it, and it's a great question too. And I wanted to kind of put it to you. And also, if I may, just add a little bit of um of a of a kind of uh, overview about another region, which is uh, uh, in New Zealand, but but Marlborough. But um, the question is uh, about how 2019. Uh, many people say is the best New Zealand vintage ever. Uh, and and uh, John wants to know what are your thoughts on, on 1920 and, and 21. Um, I, I was just going to kick off if I if I could, Mackenzie, um, just to say a little bit about uh, 19, 20 and 21 um, from from kind of New Zealand as a as a whole. And then I'd love to get you get your thoughts on on um, uh, on Martinborough uh, specifically. But it's actually funnily, funnily that this question should come in because it's been a very hot topic this last couple of weeks for me because 2021 has been a very, very, what looks like a very small vintage for New Zealand. Excellent quality, but very, very tight. And, uh, you know, it's probably no surprise to anyone really that, that Marlborough Sauvignon is what drives a lot of the volume for our New Zealand sales um, and is what allows us to then uh, work with such exciting fine wines as these um, but it's going to be a really really interesting one because 19 was an ex excellent superb quality vintage but small 20 again very good quality but smaller still and 21 sounds like the quality is great but smaller again and it's looking like it's going to be a real challenge actually when it comes to supply and demand for New Zealand uh, as a whole but also with Marlborough um, the challenge is going to be around actually keeping stock of these really high volume wines but what's it been like specifically in Martinborough and, and with Atarangi is it is it the same sort of thing as across the rest of New Zealand? Yeah yeah absolutely we've we really have had a series of very small vintages um, 
to, to be honest, I've actually been here in London since uh, I think I left in the middle of the 2018 harvest. Uh, so I haven't been on the ground. Um, but yes, they, they have been incredibly small. Uh, they have been um, incredibly promising vintages. They've been quite settled. Um, but uh, I know for, for this year, for 21, uh, we got hit really badly at Atarangi and in Martinborough with really, really poor weather, weather across flowering, which meant incredibly low yields. Um, normally the able clone misses that, but it actually it hit the able clone this year, uh, really hot summer, a little bit earlier ripening. And um, it's interesting because we had a, a similar story with these low volumes in, um, I think, 2001 and, and 2003. Okay. And um, they they really learn from that, from what I understand, um, in terms of they they picked a little bit too late with this with these smaller bunches. You know, when you have a, a much smaller yield, that everything is going to ripen a lot faster. And so they, uh, in 2003, they had very very tiny tiny berries, lots of tannin, and then um, they left the picking. Still a beautiful wine, but they left the picking a little bit late, and so. Um, you know, you you had this very powerful wine with maybe not the same level of elegance. And so I, I was talking to to Helen and to Deb and they were just saying that, you know, we learned from that experience and, um, you know, managed our picking so that we didn't have that level of shrivel and, um, and things going on. But yeah, it's, um, you know, at Atarangi, we, we are really, really lucky to be in a position where we're able to respond to the year. So I know um, in 2017, the weather was there, it rained all summer <laughs> and it was yeah. so cold and yeah. it was just like, you know, no one could remember a vintage quite like it and you know, going, you know, maybe um, 1995, um, but really it, it was pretty tough. And uh, we, we were able to, basically go down in volume so a third of the fruit that we picked we didn't actually process or or we didn't pick at all uh, so we went down about two-thirds in volume in order to maintain the quality and if you taste the 17 now it is so elegant and beautiful and you would not know the challenges of the year so really we're lucky at Atarangi we can just respond to to whatever the year is giving us. And I think I think that's also testament to um, you know your your uh, family and, and the winemaker as well to be able to produce something uh, amazing in a challenging vintage and you know I can say as a, as a wine society buyer that's exactly the type of winery that we feel it's important to work with you know wineries that are able to really make the most of a of a tricky vintage and have the skill to kind of to, to pull through uh, and you mentioned earlier about the 2001 and 2003 vintage uh, I wouldn't be surprised at all if there's somebody this evening who's got a bottle so uh, if there is you could let us know um, in the chat, how it's drinking. Um, there's lo there's loads of questions, which is fantastic. I'm going to hand over to Tim, who's going to field them much more professionally than I would be able to. Um, so Tim, I'm going to I'm going to sit back and have a glass and chip in occasionally, and I'll I'll leave the hard work to you. Thanks, Freddie. As as you've said, there are loads of questions. So I'll try to merge a few together. But Mackenzie, I'm going to start with one that uh, yeah has has come through a in a few different ways. But for those that aren't as familiar with New Zealand wines, how would you characterize Martinborough and Atarangi in, in particular compared to maybe the more slightly more well-known um, Otago wines or, or Marlborough wines? Yeah yeah absolutely so Martinborough and Central Otago are often compared obviously because the two great um, regions known for Pinot Noir and Central Otago uh, what's there 5,000 3,000 hectares uh, of planted area um, they, they are a lot larger. They, um, they get, in a lot of areas, they get a lot more heat in the vineyards during the day. They, they, they have a shorter ripening season and they get these beautiful hot, hot days. Um, and so what I love about Central Otago is this really, to me, it's about really plush fruit. Um, and for a while, the wines were quite full-bodied, quite spicy. And now I think um, they, are, they are finding that balance between plush fruit, big tannin and elegance and, and power. And I think there are probably a lot of people here who know Central Otago wines a lot better than I do and even, even Martinborough wines. And for me, Martinborough, as I was saying before, is, is really about that 
that darker fruit. So Central Otago, if I was talking in terms of fruit, I would be thinking in terms of lovely big tannins, not fruit, sorry. And then um, your more crisp red fruits, your currants and, and cherries. And then for Martinbara, to me, it's always that even with the young vines, uh, young wines, that little bit of forest floor, for Atarangi, I always get that touch of sweet hay, crushed rose petal, but with the fruit, I'm getting dark fruit and kind of much more brooding tannins. To me, Martin Barra tends to be a lot more savoury as a wine, um, if that uh, makes any sense yeah, at all. Yeah, I, I think it makes perfect yeah, sense. No, it's, a, it's a lovely explanation. And question from Jordan Wiltshire who asked, How would you commit someone that normally drinks Burgundy to try New Zealand Pinot Noir? You say that Martinborough is the, the natural gateway? Exactly. We try not to use the B word anymore. It's kind of like a, a growing, a process of growing up where we don't have to make the comparison because we're not trying to be anything. Maybe in the early days, absolutely Burgundy is a touchstone um, and the kind of the guiding light. But um, today it's all about just uh, reflecting what is Martindara or what is Central Otago, but yeah, no, you're right. And also like, <laughs> if you're trying to convince um, a Burgundy lover to to try it, just pour them a glass. It's all, yeah, it's all in there, isn't it? I, I think it's interesting to hear what you say, Mackenzie, about not wanting to kind of draw those comparisons, but at the same time, if there's somebody who's hooked on Burgundy and you want to get them into, uh, you know, a New Zealand Pinot, then, then Martin, Br I think just from smelling this, you know, the flagship wine, you can tell that actually this has got a lot that's going to appeal to those types of drinkers. Um, so it's, it's that kind of savory, spicy kind of notes, whereas uh, Otago is, is much more robust, I would say, perhaps. But uh, this is this is it's got that kind of ethereal quality on the nose that top red burgundy has. So I can see I can see why you want to uh, create your own identity for sure. Uh, that makes perfect sense. And, and the time is right for that. But uh, I can also see why this would be a perfect gateway into into top New Zealand Pinot. Yeah. And then also, if you if you have the opportunity, which I, I think people, um, some people here do to to try those older wines, something that's at least 10 years old, that it's been stored correctly, even, you know, 15 years old, that's still beautiful, elegant, going strong. Um, you know, to show the aging potential of a new world wine under screw top, um, and that it can it can sit right next to the top the top Pinot you know, Noirs of the world. That's pretty special too. And I think when you open the glass and you see that, if you have the opportunity, it, it really it really strikes you. Absolutely, completely agree. Um, a number of questions also coming through on the organic uh topic um and one asking if you are considering going further into the biodynamic route is, is that something you're considering or we use a lot of the practices always have done um for us it's really two things it's really about responding to what the land gives us so the kind of hard and fast rules of biodynamics if we were to become certified don't necessarily make sense for every wine region you know if you um it's not it can be a little a little cookie cutter sometimes um it's a it's a fantastic philosophy so we use a lot of those practices um but again it's just it's almost just part of what we do um you know it's it, it's not the box ticking or the paperwork it's just part of the way that we like to respond to the, the land and, and make the wine that makes sense Absolutely. And then a question also about the vine age and just how important is vine age to the longevity of, of the wines? Yeah. Um, just trying to think how to answer this best. Quite a, so that's actually a sort of a more complex question than I think it initially sounds, isn't it? And just to very quickly jump in on that, Mackenzie, sorry. Uh, but I think the um, crimson is quite a good representation of this question, because as you were saying before, it was initially the kind of the young vine wine. Um, and I mean, I, have, I haven't, I must admit, I haven't tasted any 
kind of older vintages of crimson as they were released. Um, so this is it's only recently that I've kind of gotten to know crimson. But I think what this wine shows is that as those wines have gone from young to actually fairly mature, um, the wine itself has also become much more kind of serious and has much more potential for for aging, even as a wine which is actually designed to drink quite young. Uh, there, there was a question just to touch on it from somebody who was asking about the drink window of the Crimson. And we said um, just before this, uh, before we went uh, live with this, we were chatting about it and saying that as much as I've put to, up to 2025 on this wine, it would easily go long beyond that. You know, it would do 10 years easily. And I guess that that's come as a result of those vines getting a bit mature, would you say? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And you see, you just see different characters in, from the older vines, you see more complexity. They're obviously producing less, but what they do is incredibly complex and it does tend to um, create those kind of deeper, richer characters. And then also um, something about the quality of the tannin that you get in old vines is really special. I remember dad, he tasted the 2009 out of barrel for the first time back in the 2009 vintage and he just went what is that smell there's something different here and he went that smells like burgundy and for him it's what he calls we kind of roll our eyes a little bit but it's what he calls European tannin when you start to see that level of vine age that we were getting for the Atarangi Pino in 2009 you were starting to see a different quality in the tannins that that um that really matched with with some of the top Pinot Noirs of the world yeah fantastic and I guess yeah so much of that comes from just the vines maturing and growing up and what they can produce becomes that bit more concentrated and, and serious I suppose yeah and and yeah and incredibly important for aging potential too Although these these always have been wines that can age. Um, we are in the, to, sorry, yeah. in, in the winery, what sort of, uh, how do you treat the wines? In oak, large barrels, small barrels? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we actually use Bordeaux bar uh, Burgundy barrels by Bordeaux Coopers and we, Helen mixes up the Coopers so that we don't have one particular style um, kind of overtaking. Uh, Atarangi Pino typically spends about 11 months in oak, of which depend, depending on the year, somewhere between 25 and 35% is new oak, the low toast, and then for the crimson, just because it is that little bit younger, the um, nine months in oak and 20%, 25% new oak, depending on the year. Um, and uh, really, really low intervention in the winery. So really no fining or filtering. Um, we've been using indigenous yeasts for possibly since before I was born. Um, again, just part of the, the philosophy, the way we do things. And then working back, going backwards even further, a uh, whole bunch of fermentation. We had a, a wonderful talk last night from uh, Domaine Bontil, the Burgundy producer about which focus quite a bit on a whole bunch, but yeah, is that uh, a process you're using? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And we have been doing for, for a long time. Again, it depends on the year, it depends on the quality of the fruit, but I know for the 18, it was about 35% whole bunch. And uh, there are a lot of things that whole bunch does, but one of them that we find quite special is because the fermentation for whole bunch starts inside the berry, it's not actually in contact with the stalks and the skins and it's not extracting um, all of that color and all of that tannin so it adds this incredibly perfumed fragrant elegant portion to the wine um, which is to me so cool in terms of balancing those powerful characters with with elegance with crushed rose petal with something that that really dances between the two And then a question on just the consistency that you have. And uh, we have some, uh, Freddie, you might want to reveal the plans that we have in September about the, the mixed case, but they does seem to be a remarkable consistency of wines. What, what do you put that down to? Is it is it terroir or is it something else? So are you cut out a little bit there. Were you saying consistency of wines? Yeah. Uh, so just consistency of vintage. What, what do you put down the... Um, is it the fact that you just make smaller amounts in the in the tougher, more challenging vintages? Or I 
think it's just about responding to to what the year gives you, to what the land is giving you, to what the weather is giving you. And the, the team at Atarangi, you know, Helen did her first vintage at Atarangi in 1999 and then she rejoined in 2003. Clive has been on the land since 1980. Ellie's been on the land since 1985. Uh, they remember almost every harvest. So you have this group of people who know the land and know the vines so well. And, you know, they'll be talking and you'll be talking about how 17 was tough and they'll go oh you know but it was like 95 and someone will go no it wasn't anything like 95 it was don't you remember 1987 um so <laughs> there is that incredible wealth of of knowledge and experience and and love for the land um but then also that ability to 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 drive for quality and to drive for um I know I'm I'm sounding like a stuck record here but but for world-class wine so knowing Helen, Clive, even, you know, all of our, our vineyard crew, um, our, sorry, our winery crew, they know the wine so well. So we'll be looking at the, the different barrels and I'll say, oh my goodness, this is so floral, this is so punchy. And Helen or Clive will go, that's Kortinger every year, no matter what, this vineyard always produces this character. And we know that if the wind is, is coming from the south a lot, you've got to get this from that vineyard. Um, Knowledge, also just, you know, uh, quality above all else. We are able to be flexible on that um, at the size that we're at. I guess um, just, just to add to that as well, um, one of the things that I think sets top wineries like Atarangi apart is the um, ability to kind of tell the story of a vintage. So to allow the wine to speak of the vintage from which it was produced, rather than trying to just out and out produce a consistent product year on year because then when you try and force that too much I think then you end up with less good quality wines whereas if you're able and skilled enough as a winemaker to recognize the positives even in the most tricky vintages and pull those out then you can make wines which might well be different year on year in terms of their personality some might be more approachable early than others but you'll always have a top quality wine and I think that's something that that, that Atarangi do do really well well said <laughs> exactly that ability to respond to the year to the vineyard and you see Atarangi actually makes nine or ten wines across the range not just Pinot Noir although that is the bulk of our production and you see that each wine and each vintage has its own personality there's a common thread through them all yeah. but you you know the family um, we talk about them as if they're different people yeah and then talking about that vintage variation Freddie you've been building up some stocks over the last few years in in order to to show a a mixed case for members later this year yeah so um basically I mean these wines it's, it's no surprises we've touched on it um but these wines age so remarkably well and when I took on our uh, New Zealand range back a couple of years ago, um, I was lucky enough that my predecessor, Sarah, who's very much on the ball, uh, obviously uh, had worked a bit with Atarangi and, um, and had already bought a couple of vintages, which were sitting in our, in our keeping stocks. And I tasted a couple of them and just, uh, you know, they're, they're remarkable wines. And so I was quite keen to, to, to keep on with these and um, allow the wines to have a little bit of age before we release them where possible. Um, so the plan is, touch wood, uh, in September we'll be releasing a little um, uh, vertical mixed case with, with three vintages. So 2014 is the oldest vintage that we've currently got. Um, we've also got 15, 17 and 18 um so uh keep an eye out for those the, the challenge of course is that they're very uh very sought after wines uh they they don't hang around long and and you know they're made in small quantities so keeping my fingers crossed that we still have enough <laughs> in september to release a vertical case the, the problem might be that i might buy them and drink them all myself because they're so good <laughs> and i'm just conscious of the time but uh mackenzie you're obviously family part of the family but over here in London uh we call London the capital of the wine world are, are you just here to try to uh explore and get as much uh international experience as possible before 
going back to take on over the reins or? Interesting question. Um, I would say I am putting in the work now so that I have the knowledge so that if that becomes a possibility and that's something that the family and my siblings want to do, there are, there are four of us, um, then, then I'm well placed to do so, but who knows? Well, I guess we'll see. <laughs> are, your, are your siblings quite keen on it uh, themselves as well? Are they quite, quite behind the, the winery and everything? So my sister Vanessa, who who was there at, at the start of Atarangi, she's um, she works at Atarangi now. So she uh, she went away for a, for a long time, and she came back in two thousand eighteen. And uh, she, uh, some of you will admit her if you visited in the last couple of years. Uh, she manages the the visitor experience. She's incredible. We um we moved our format now. So Atarangi is you you get to sit down with a member of the family and and taste the wines. Um, and go around the vineyard and spend about an hour doing that. Um, so she's she's in charge of that and marketing. So she's very much involved. My uh, my our middle sister. So I'm the baby. Ness is the oldest, and then my middle sister is a soil scientist. But she's currently she's currently working as an environmental soil scientist. Um, nothing to do with wine, but uh, you know. And then my cousin my cousin who is Ellie's son. He's a little younger. Um, but you know we'll see see what happens so it's, it looks like it'll stay in the family which is which is good which is key um not saying anything yet <laughs> um tim i know that we're, we're running over a little bit can we treat this as a semi lock-in maybe we can we can get to a couple more couple more questions uh yeah sure i was, was going to wrap it up but uh but there's still plenty plenty there uh i've one that often gets asked, uh, and I think members love to hear, what do actual, what do winemakers drink for fun when they're not drinking their own wines? So if you've got the family around or a big barbecue, what, what are you drinking? Anything and everything that's not atarangi. You know, it, it's an honest always... <laughs> Sorry? It's an honest answer, at least. <laughs> well, you know, we're always... Um, talking to dad he's 70 something we're always learning and you know we've always got winemakers from all over the world and we're just constantly tasting different things from from europe from the new world we you know we we're not very dogmatic we'll we'll drink anything um, but it's really you know it's always a fantastic opportunity to try beautifully made wines from all over the world and and be inspired by them you must be you must be about the only family in the world who are making a point of not drinking drinking atarangi uh, at a barbecue. Uh, yeah, well, it's when you come and visit for the barbecue that we open the okay. pizza. Fantastic! I'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> so, so speak, speaking of visiting, when when do you think is the best time of year to to visit? Many many people have been talking about visiting already, but uh, yeah, I'm sure a lot are planning their trips at this time when we can't, but. Uh, um, I mean, if you can get there in the summer, it's really busy. Um, but so book in your visit at Atarangi. We would love to see you, but just book well in advance because we we have to keep it quite small just so that we can give you the proper experience. Um, I mean, any time of year. Winter's a bit, you know. Um, chilly. Yeah. Chilly, <laughs> wet. You know, New Zealand in winter... If you're coming for a skiing trip with a, you know, and then you come via mountain barra, then great. But, uh, you know, I think at this stage, anytime you can get a flight. We can't be, yeah, beggars can't afford to be choosers at the moment, can they? So uh, I think exactly. as soon as, as soon as it's possible, I think as many people yeah. on this, uh, this uh, Zoom session will be at Atarangi as soon as we can. I'm, I'm certainly one of them. <laughs> Brilliant. And yeah, I think a few beers at the Marterborough Hotel. Uh, and yeah, I think a few beers at the afterwards could be a uh, cards. I've seen a couple of members uh, mention that as well. So uh, yeah, I think 2024, I, I'm trying to convince the, the powers that be that uh, we celebrate our 150th anniversary a global world tour with the Tastings Events team is, uh, is what's called for. So uh, Keep do, do watch this space. So. Can't, can't make any promises, but yep. we'll, we'll I've just seen rest. space gold on the on the <laughs> comment list. <laughs> Not Tui. <laughs> but yeah.
Yeah. Um. Uh, so unfortunately, despite Freddie's plans for a lock-in, we do have to have to wrap it up there. Uh, thank you very much, McKenna. Uh, thank you. Wonderful seeing the chat. There's been some super fans. We've actually got uh, Margaret Harvey, MW, the first importer of Atarangi into, into the UK on, on the call. So, oh, um, no, great. People drinking back vintages back to the 90s. So, yeah, I think it is. Yeah, very, very important to mention Margaret as putting New Zealand and Martin Barra wine on the map in London as well. Um, an incredible figure. So very, very excited to have her here. So, yeah, I think everyone's loved, loved hearing from you and uh, getting that insight into, into the family that, that, uh, behind the label, which uh, is a common theme in so many of our events. And I think it's been something that uh, members have really enjoyed being able to uh, yeah, peer behind the curtain, as it will. Exactly. Oh, brilliant. Uh, just Mackenzie, want to say a huge thank you to you for taking the time out of your evening to uh, talk to us a little bit about the winery and take us through uh, these two 2018 wines. It's been it's been absolutely fantastic. I've thoroughly enjoyed myself. I'm sure everybody else has as well. Um, huge thanks to everybody who's who's tuned in this evening. Um, I I am just so chuffed to see the the amount of feedback and comments and questions and all that sort of thing. So apologies we couldn't get to everything um but uh thank you to those of you who have uh taken part and and tim massive thanks to you and the tasting team as well for for hosting us this evening it's been as usual very well run and an absolute pleasure so so cheers to you guys thank you so much for having me here um it's it's fantastic to get the opportunity to talk about it and to see so many people who who know and love the wines or are getting to know them and that you guys are such, um, the Wine Society are such great supporters. So thank you. It's a pleasure. Should we finish on a cheers? We can all cheers. I've got a little bit left in the glass here. Cheers to you, Mackenzie, and cheers to everyone watching and hope everyone has a good night. Cheers, everyone. Thank you so much.